the September and October NSDA public forum topic is resolved the United States federal government ought pay reparations to African Americans. A lot of you have talked about this topic at some kind of summer institute already or online with your team before the season starts. So this is going to spend a little bit of time and overview of the wording of the topic, some of the ideas of what the topic is not, and how different people may have mishandled the topic on their first impressions, and then from there delve into some of the actual arguments on the topic. So let's start by breaking down the wording. It says United States federal government, not just the United States, not just the US government, United States federal government. And what that does is it excludes things that state governments may owe reparations for, or U.S.-based corporations may owe reparations for, and focuses explicitly on whether or not the federal government ought pay reparations. This means that we're not talking about things that the state governments did. We might be talking about things the federal government allowed to happen, but we are definitely talking about things the federal government caused to happen. This means that smart pro teams arguing for reparations are going to try and link it to some particular court decision, some particular federal agency, or something that isn't able to be the responsibility of anyone else. Pro teams can also say that even if some other institution or business or agency ought to pay reparations, that does not mean the federal government ought not and it is responsible for pretty much everything that happens under its watch, and that's really the only way that's going to get developed in round. Federal can also be defined to mean simply a two-tiered government system, rather than the central government, but when used in the context of the United States federal government, it is almost always used to mean the central of the two governments in a federal system. Ought. This is an ought topic. These are fairly rare. Ought instead of should usually implies a question of obligation, most frequently, but not exclusively, moral obligation. When you're debating whether we ought to do something, we are not debating necessarily practical consequences of it. This encourages a backwards-looking view of reparations, which we'll talk about in a little bit more depth later on. But generally speaking, it means that even if something might be impractical to do, or unfeasible to do, or won't happen, Maybe it's still something we can't do, but ought to do. Maybe it's still something that has bad consequences, but we still ought to find some way to do it. Ought also implies that we're not really tied up in issues of solvency so much as issues of obligation. At the same time, when we're talking about a government, ought might mean moral obligations, it might mean contractual obligations, it might mean competing obligations. A con team could certainly make the case that there are a lot of things the United States federal government ought to be doing, and maybe one of them it ought to do in a vacuum, but if that would stop it from doing two or more other things that it also ought to do, then it no longer ought to do that thing. Pay is usually just going to be defined in the context of reparations and two. Defining these words individually is typically going to be less helpful. Pay reparations instead of give reparations steers the debate away from social programs and towards monetary reparations, or at the very least, vouchers. Um, pay reparations, too, steers it away from just general programs, away from colorblind reparations, and towards things that are specifically directed towards African Americans. But generally speaking, pay also implies that we're less concerned with repatriating, reparative justice, anything like that, but more the actual payment of the reparations themselves. Reparations can be defined a few different ways. Most commonly, reparations are in cash or in kind, where in kind doesn't just mean any generic thing, but something specifically related to the offense in question. Reparations are often used when we're talking about restitution on a domestic level, or reparations on an international level, this falls somewhere in between, because on the one hand we are talking about an entire country, on the other hand they are being paid within the country rather than to a different country, so there are arguments for each kind of precedent bearing more weight than the other. Some people will define reparations as cash only. Other people will define reparations as something which has to meet certain conditions to be a genuine reparation, i.e. it has to be sincere, 
it has to guarantee the cessation of the things the reparation is for, which allows some interesting discussions on the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments that we'll get into later. But beyond that, teams are mainly going to look at reparations in terms of are they justified on forward-looking grounds or backward-looking grounds. When reparations are justified on backward-looking grounds, it is merely a question of did you do something for which reparations are owed? Did I rob from this person? Well, maybe he's a billionaire, but that doesn't change that I owe him something. Did I do something wrong that I can't afford to pay back for? It doesn't change the fact that I owe reparations and I ought to pay them, merely whether or not I can pay them. So backwards looking says all that matters is whether or not we owe something. Not what the effects of giving what we owe will be, but simply whether it is owed in the first place. Forward looking reparations are less concerned about why we owe the reparations and more concerned with the effects of the reparations will be and what benefits they will have on the community the reparations go to. So for instance, forward looking approach to reparations would say that if it makes things worse before it makes things better, or if it prevents other more beneficial things from happening, then we ought not give reparations because it's not a question of what we owe for the past so much as what obligations we have towards in the future. So that's one of the bigger clashes you will see on the definition of reparations. Again, two versus four versus in the general direction of, if you are paying reparations to African Americans, then that probably means that you're not just looking at programs that generally alleviate poverty or generally benefit education or generally benefit people in the inner city, just because urban and inner city are used as code words for black by politicians does not mean that reparations that are just social programs targeting anyone in the inner city are to African Americans, and there's a distinction there. Lastly, African Americans. It says the reparations are to African Americans. Some people prefer that term over black. Some people prefer black over African American. There are legitimate arguments for both. Outside of this topic, when in doubt, if someone tells you what they want to be called, just call them that. It's really that simple. For the purposes of this topic, African Americans probably includes a slightly larger group of people. It probably isn't really a question of any kind of blood quantum or anything like that. But at the same time, it can be a question of just any one of like four or five different census entries being counted as African American. African American really came into popularity late 80s, early 90s, Rainbow Coalition as an alternative to black, but at the same time can include recent African immigrants whose parents came here in the 80s or 90s and might not necessarily be people who are owed reparations for these same things as people whose ancestors came here unwillingly during the Triangle Trade in the late 18th century. So, at that point, we need to look at this more in terms of how do we decide who these reparations go to? Who counts? Please note the reparation, sorry, the resolution does not say reparations for slavery. It says reparations to African Americans. This means that reparations could be for slavery. They could be for the Southern Redemption in the years of Jim Crow after that. They could be for the separate but equal times after that. They could be for the discriminatory housing practices that continued up through the 1960s. They could be for the discriminatory voting rights laws, the last one of which was finally knocked off the books in Alaska in 1973, or they could be about ongoing injustices in the present. So there really isn't a time frame for when these reparations are owed from outside of what teams articulate in the round. All right, let's go ahead and talk about some things the resolution does not say, because here's where a lot of teams kind of stray off track. So, for starters, the resolution does not say the United States federal government ought to do something nice for African Americans. 
If it's a reparation, it's a reparation for some kind of past wrong specifically. This means it has to have some kind of relation to that. It also means that something which happens to benefit them doesn't count as a reparation in and of itself. This means, again, more funding for Head Start, probably not actually a reparation to African Americans. A lot of the plan-like things that people are trying to run don't necessarily have too much bearing on this topic. The resolution also does not say the United States federal government ought pay reparations to African Americans and nobody else. There are some con teams who have been arguing, well, if we give them reparations, then these other groups will also be justified in wanting reparations. And while that may be true, the resolution doesn't forbid us from paying reparations to other groups if the con team proves that those groups are owed reparations, which the con team probably really doesn't want to do in the first place because that's really not helping their case at all here, unless it's done as kind of a broader-based coalitions argument, but we'll get into that later. Aside from that, another thing that the resolution does not say is the United States federal government ought give benefits to African Americans. And one can make the argument that vouchers might be reparations, anything less than them, probably not. Affirmative action, perhaps, because it was framed as a reparation in part when it was created, but anything that's not specifically directed is going to have a hard time actually being linked into the resolution against a good con team. So, for instance, if I say, we've done all of these things wrong, we owe something for them, as a result of that, we need to give better schooling, or we need to give cheaper rent, or we need to give housing vouchers. Those might not have too much bearing on the original offense, but they're also probably not actual reparations in a meaningful sense. If I burn somebody's house down, and I'm ordered to pay reparations for that, I don't get to say, well, I don't want to give you money because I don't think you'll build a very good house with it. I'm not convinced that you'll actually do the right thing with this. I'm not sure you should have this money. I'd much rather just give you something else nice instead. That's probably not a reparation. Vouchers are often used by pro teams who are trying to avoid the issue of cost, which really means they're used by pro teams that don't understand how vouchers work. If you were going to spend money on housing, and you're going to spend vouchers on housing, the voucher still costs the government the same amount of money, unless you are deliberately shortchanging what you believe is actually owed in reparations. The only main difference on this topic between spending money and giving vouchers is that giving vouchers basically says, we don't trust you to make a good decision with what we are giving you as reparations. The resolution also does not say African Americans ought accept reparations from the United States federal government. The question is about the federal government's obligation to pay. It is not about whether or not accepting these reparations is correct, is beneficial, etc. A con team could spend a lot of time arguing that reparations will be rejected or ought be rejected, but that's not a reason the federal government ought not offer, and arguing in that direction doesn't really directly clash with the resolution. So be aware of that going into your rounds as well. Reparations does also have an S on the end. It is not necessarily a single reparation after which everything is even, everything is over. That is another common misreading of the resolution. Simply offering reparations does not mean that things are actually even after the reparations. That's a common misconception. Nobody says, well, Germany paid reparations for the Holocaust, therefore everybody forgot the Holocaust happened. That's 
not how this works. There are arguments that can be made about whether reparations will help whitewash history or whether reparations will help spark a conversation and remind people of history, but that's what needs to be debated out in round. You can't really make an assumption off of that based off of what you think the resolution says. The resolution also does not say that the United States federal government and nobody else ought to pay reparations to African Americans. So at that point, a con team arguing that it is more the insurance companies, the banks, and the shipping companies that profited most from slavery, or if it is them just arguing that the states produced more offenses than the federal government did, that is simply a case that someone else owes reparations to, not an argument against reparations being owed. Similarly, when you look at reparations for World War I and World War II, you see that both companies within nations and the nations themselves paid those reparations. And you can see the same thing looking at the United States, which is actually a decent segue into historical precedent. Back in late colonial times in the U.S., before chattel slavery had actually been entrenched so much, there were common transitions out of slavery, and some former slaves did manage to get reparations for their treatment, back before it got more codified right before the Revolution and right after the Revolution. Beyond that, there have also been reparations paid to other groups in the United States, most notably Japanese Americans post-World War II. Now, reparations don't need to be for something that was illegal at the time, or even something that has become illegal since then. The Supreme Court case that justified the Japanese internment camps, Korematsu versus United States, is still on the books as correctly decided. Now, admittedly, many justices since then have said if they knew what they knew now, they would have decided differently, that they believe it should be considered incorrectly decided, but it is still settled precedent as far as the law is concerned. We did not pay reparations because what we did was illegal. We paid reparations because we came to believe what we did was wrong and some degree of restitution was owed for that. Reparations for the mid-1940s were justified in 1985 and enacted in 1988 predominantly through cash payments. Kuramatsu becomes disanalogous as a reason for justification when you look at other cases that have been overturned since then when we're talking about African Americans. Very often this is going to look back to things like Dred Scott, then Plesky v. Ferguson, before all the cases that we got to with the Warren Court. Though at the same time, a pro team could theoretically talk about reparations owed for decisions since then, like Milliken v. Bradley, and how busing patterns reinforce segregated school districts. So it doesn't need to be limited in the same way that it was limited to an event. The other place that the Japanese-American analogy falls apart is the idea of nationality versus the idea of race. We paid reparations to a specific nationality. We did not pay it based on a particular ethnicity. And there's an important distinction there. It was very easy to know who was owed reparations for the internment camps. It's not so easy to know which African Americans are owed reparations, how much they are owed, how we decide that. And at first, this seems like a difficult thing for the pro team to explain because the pro team has to talk about, like, do we either let people self-identify anybody who thinks they're African-American gets reparations? Does Rachel Dolezal get reparations? Do we establish courts to determine who gets reparations? Do we have panels that determine blood quantum and re-entrench the same systems of racial classification that we are trying to avoid and that got us into this mess in the first place? And really, there's two ways out of this for pro. The first way is just to say, well, if we have to pick, then we might as well just look at the census, see who has a family member that identified themselves as black, 
African American, etc., on the census prior to reparations being announced or prior to whatever event the pro team argues reparations are owed for. The second thing is just to sidestep the question entirely, and I think that this really deals with the majority of con arguments I have heard on this topic. This topic is hard to negate correctly. A lot of con teams' arguments against this are not arguing against reparations, they are arguing how reparations ought to be given. And I think that smart pro teams on this topic will, in many rounds, win on the difference between prescriptive con arguments and prohibitive con arguments. If the con team is arguing that one form of reparations is bad, or that we can't afford to pay this much in reparations, or that reparations ought not be done this way, all they are doing is clarifying what kind of reparations ought be paid. The question is not if we owe reparations, it is how we ought pay reparations at that point. Con teams need the challenge if we ought pay reparations. Once they start haggling about the how, they have already admitted the resolution is true and are probably going to lose. This ties back in to the forward-looking versus backward-looking distinction I talked about a little bit earlier. Basically, what pro teams are probably going to say on this topic is we look backwards to decide if we ought to pay reparations. We look forwards to decide how we ought to pay reparations. Any objections from a con team that don't say we owe them nothing, a pro team is going to try and characterize as, okay, well now that you established we owe them something, we have won, but we can still talk about how best to give them what we owe them, but that would not be a reason to negate. Aside from that, there are a lot of individual arguments that can be discussed on this topic. Most of them fall into the broad categories we've talked about already. I will do a follow-up to this that talks about specific arguments in more depth. Go ahead and message me, leave comments in the group or on this video about specific arguments you want dissected in more detail, and I will gladly look at those in more depth. Same with definitions, same with ways to frame the topic. But generally speaking, the majority of clashes on this topic are going to come from whether or not the government has an obligation to pay some kind of reparation for past wrongs, and con teams want to pick one of those three areas to try and disrupt at. Thanks for watching. Go ahead and leave questions about specific arguments for the follow-up, and I will try and put as many of them in there as I can. Best of luck in September and October.